Okay, well, let's get started. We're, we're here. Happy New Year, by the way. We're here for a, a new year and a new book. Well, not a new book, but a new new to us book. And that is Turia Pitt and her book, Happy. And the subtitle, And Other Ridiculous Aspirations, which I thought was a great, a great <laughs> subtitle as well. Why is it a ridiculous aspiration? Well, I don't know if you've had a chance to see, I put a little video in our, in our Facebook group, um, on the, on the Facebook page there. And it is, um, a video of, of when she was first in hospital. This young lady at the age of 24 was an ultra marathon runner, supremely fit, uh, very tenacious, very attractive young lady. And she was, um, a mining engineer had the world at her feet, as they say, and she was decided to run in an ultra marathon in the north of Western Australia. <coughs> Excuse me. And unfortunately, things went wrong. And an unexpected bushfire came through and suddenly she found herself trapped. And they rescued her by helicopter, but by the time they got to her, she suffered 65% burns to her body. And incredibly survived uh, the doctor said in the video that you'll you'll see there that none of his patients had ever been burnt that badly and survived so that says a lot about her tenacity and her absolute determination to get through it and full credit to her after numerous very painful surgeries she has gradually uh, repaired her, her body to a large extent um, obviously, she had suffered some irreparable damage, such as uh, losing a few of her fingers. Um, obviously, this, the burn scars on, on her are, are bad, but uh, gradually she's had reconstructive surgery. I mean, she lost most of her nose. Um, extensive burns, I mean, unbelievable. And you see the footage of it. She had to wear a mask for two years. Mm. Uh, what she went through nobody should ever have to go through but she came through it and reinvented herself uh ironically joe and i first encountered this lady we were on holiday uh, and ironically that it should be on our wedding anniversary i'm telling you this um we were on our honeymoon in the maldives in uh, 2018 i think it was and uh we saw taria pitt on on a boat uh in as we were out on a boat one day um, being taken on a tour and her boat went past and we had a bo boat full of nurses on board as well so everyone instantly recognized her and called out to her and she she was on the back deck and waved to us so i can say i've actually waved to taria pitt i haven't spoken to her i haven't actually met her but i come quite close to her and um yeah so we were both sort of fascinated and when i came across her book uh, i had to buy it straight away and find out more about what she's gone through she's reinvented herself now as a public speaker and as an inspirational coach for people uh, and obviously going through something like that um it has a big impact you know when when you're in the audience and you're you're watching her videos or listening to her speak listening to her ted talks listening to her audiobook um there's there's a lot of power behind her voice there in in terms of if I can survive this, you know, what are you whinging about? <laughs> She's not, she doesn't say that, but I mean, <laughs> you know, that's the message I get from it. Um, there's a lot of speakers who have similar, not as extreme as that, but have bad situations and get through it and then use that as a, as a lever to go, well, if I can deal with this, you know, maybe you can relate to your problems don't seem quite so bad. I always remember Andrew Matthews the author of being happy saying uh you may have a sore knee and if your knee is sore yeah it might sort of comfort you a little bit to know that somebody else has got a broken leg and they're dealing with it okay but your knee is still sore <laughs> so uh you know we all have our problems and our problems are real to us but then when you see something like this uh, you go wow how would i deal with that could i deal with that would i get through it you know i mean what incredible reserves and strength of character to come through something like that so are we shocked <laughs> she is an absolute rock star as celeste barber says on the on the cover there um 
Celeste Barber being a great Australian, I think Australia, yeah, she's an Australian comedian, comedian, sorry. Um, and she puts out some fantastic Instagram posts. Um, <laughs> I'd recommend having a look at those. So Taria Pitt asked this question, is it possible to be happier? And what does she discover about the whole concept of the aspiration of being happy? Well, let's get into it. Firstly, before we do, has anyone had a chance to read any of it yet? <laughs> no. No, well, right, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you a pass because it is the new year and we've just started and everyone's slowly clawing their way back into work mode or to getting off the couch, stopping eating Christmas cake, leftovers. <laughs> we, we have, we're still being, we used the last of the Christmas cake last night because we've had my brother-in-law staying and he, he wanted some every night. All right. So she starts with a letter to the reader, which I thought was a lovely way of doing it as a, as a preface. And um, she makes this comment. You are special. There's never been and is no one else on the planet who has your life circumstances, your personality, your upbringing and your hair. That makes you unique. Assuming you've still got hair, of course. And it makes it very hard to write a personalized book just for you. So this book is mainly about me. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, not about me, but about what I believe to be true about happiness. She has a lovely writing style. It's very, uh, very humorous, very Australian. Uh, you know, she speaks as if she's speaking to you. And, and I love that about it. Joe's read the book as well. She loves it too. Um, it's not just about the incident, the fact that she's got badly burnt and that she's recovering it's it's about life in general you know and about all the the situations that all of us feel obviously she does reference what she's gone through and some of the little wins along the way and some of the things that she reminds us not to take for granted in a in a very impactful way i have to say i mean the way she writes for example Here's another paragraph. This is my take, my spin on it. Having been th through something pretty hectic, rebuilt my life from the ground up and in the process done some really cool shit. <laughs> that's, a, that's an Aussie way of putting it, isn't it? <laughs> done some really cool shit. So this young lady, her husband stuck with her and helped her as best he could through that situation as well. They've continued on and built a normal life. I say normal. What is normal? Who knows what normal is, but a life as best they can for themselves. And in some ways, um, she's done things that she would probably never have done had it not been for this life changing situation. They've gone on, on and had, had, um, had a family. So, mm. you know, fair play to them. They, they've, they've got through this together. Some of the strategies she says that, that she shares are easy to master. To boost your happiness literally all you need to do is hug someone but some of them are a bit more challenging and to boost your happiness you must have a purpose in life so okay introduction start here please she wrote most of this book in 2019 whilst pregnant with her second son and she set out to discover whether happiness was an aspiration worth pursuing well, let's ask, are we happy? Are you guys happy? Would you say you're happy at the moment? I am very happy. See, what's, happy isn't, it's not a definition. Definition. Exactly. What is your definition of happy? What, what makes, what, which things make you happy? Brown paper packages tied up with string. <laughs> These are a few of my favorite things. <laughs> I mean, it's coming from somewhere <laughs> yeah i don't know it just popped into my brain i have a strange brain sometimes so what sort of things make you happy well let's start with this introduction and get into it people wanting to know why she was so happy and how they could get some of it too what they were really asking was how can you survive a grass fire suffer burns to 65 percent of your body have your life and appearance fundamentally changed and still um, be happy? It's a good question, isn't it? Mm. Um, 
I'll apologize for anyone who's um, squeamish about swear words, but she says, and how could they get through their fucked up divorce, cancer, diagnosis, crippling self-doubt and be happy as well? So everyone's got their stuff going on, whatever it is. And it might just be, you know, a minor thing. It might just be you're having a bad day, bad week, bad month. All right. So she says an uncertain future was about the only real certainty that they could rely on as they as she went through. Um, well, she's talking about where her hometown almost burnt down in late 2019. Bushfires were going up and down. And uh, for a while there, they were they were stuck at home, a bit like when we had the COVID lockdown, I suppose. So I looked at the positives. I got more family time, more time at home, more time to cook, more time with my new baby. But when I turned on the news, it was hard not to be sucked into the fear inducing vortex that it created. So we see this theme come up in a few books, don't we? <laughs> Turning on the, the TV and getting the news and all the bad stuff that's going on in the world around you does spread a, um, a blanket of fear across, across your situation, doesn't it? If you let it. So she got into doing things like breathing exercises. She started writing emails under the guise of 14 days of happiness, little strategies that she came up with. And uh, so, yes, this book can teach you how to be happier. Being kind to people can help make you happier. Doing things that you like doing, good workouts, ordering lasagna for dinner, a real treat. And, uh, and well, this was a friend who's writing to her and saying, I told, told my wife how much I love her. Thank you, Taria. So, yes, this book can teach you how to be happier. But I want to be very, very clear. The constant never-ending quest for happiness is not only exhausting, but unattainable. I'm not saying that improving your happiness is unattainable because it's very much attainable. And that's exactly why I've written this book. But I am saying that there's no end point. The journey's a continuum with ample space for improvement along the way. In fact, it's a wiggle line and dependent on and impacted by life events that are often out of our control. So it's how we deal with both the events we didn't see coming and the ones that are in our control that's key to our ability to enjoy our lives. So another theme, again, that we, we've seen in quite a few of these books that we reviewed in the last, um, in the last couple of years now is it, it's really down to you. It's down to how you react and respond. It's not the things that happen to you because bad stuff happens to all of us at some point. We know that's going to happen. It's a given. But how do we respond? How do we pick up? Excuse me one second. <laughs> right back at you, baby. Um, just had my wife hand me a note to say happy anniversary. And Ember's is open today, which is our favorite restaurant around the corner. So it looks like we're going out for breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> so there we go. Well, I'm happy. <laughs> so, uh, all right. So she's got, she says, I'm going to show you how to get the most out of your emotions. We know that you're going to have the lighter emotions, like joy, contentment, and humor. But we also got to recognize that darker emotions like guilt and shame are at their essence just emotions and there's absolutely nothing wrong with experiencing them from time to time in fact in some or indeed in some circumstances they're the only possible emotions we can feel so we should let them in and accept them they are valid and necessary for the human experience so this is not a book that's going to tell you you know just be cheerful all the time because we know that life isn't like that life you're going to get hit with stuff that's going to make you feel the darker emotions occasionally. And that's okay. What's not okay is to stay there wallowing in it. It's how we bounce back, isn't it, really? So instead, focus on amplifying happy moments. Practice gratitude. Well, there's a familiar theme, isn't there? How many books have we read now that have said <laughs> practice gratitude? And I'm grateful for that. That was my sort of lame dad joke attempt for the first thing in the morning. Uh, be present with your loved ones. Savor the good times. Learn to love yourself. Try to have fun. Enjoy your friends and family. And be kind. 
well, there you go. You don't need to read the rest of the book now. You've yeah, got the, you know, the blueprint there. <laughs> You'll make you know, this is her, you know, this is her fourth book. Is it really? No, I didn't know that. Yeah, and she's got a she's got a kids book coming out at the end of this January. Fair play to her. I mean, you think what what she's been through has, in some way, given her the freedom to do this. I mean, if she was she was back doing her old job that she had before all this happened, she probably would be too busy, busy, to get this sort of stuff done, <laughs> wouldn't she? And now she maybe she's busier than ever, but she's busy doing something that she's passionate about because she's spreading joy and helping people deal with the stuff they're dealing with. So will this lead you down the path of hedonistic mania? Yes, to an extent. <laughs> You'll make time for indulgences, family and loved ones. You'll stop being so busy and start spending your days in a more meaningful way on stuff you enjoy. You'll spend money, but on things that will actually make you happy, as opposed to things that will gather dust, and you'll appreciate yourself. So there you go. She quotes a few other books that are worth reading and a few people that have, that have inspired her. Um, one of them being Mick Fanning. Uh, you might remember him for The Shark Puncher. Yeah. He's got Shark a good story. As with everything in life, you get out what you put in. So brace yourselves for a joyful ride and let's crack this happiness thing together. See, real Aussie. <laughs> so chapter one, gratitude, savoring, anticipation. All right, what are your thoughts so far, people? You want, want to add anything? First impression. No, I, haven't, I, haven't, I haven't read the book yet, but I watched a, a few. I was trying to get, but I watched a lot of the YouTube clips and stuff like that on it and um, listened to a few podcasts where she was interviewed and stuff. So, yeah, it's very interesting. <laughs> Joe actually went on a Zoom call with her just before Christmas. And, nice. Yeah, she's she's a very inspirational lady. Yep. Okay. Well, chapter one is called Gratitude, Savoring, and Anticipation. In our first chapter together, I want to give you, dear reader, dear reader, a quick win. I call it GSA. That's gratitude, saving, anticipation, right? So these, this will, this GSA in your life will more than likely increase your happiness levels. It's not guaranteed, though. Why? Well, because nothing is guaranteed in this life, sweet cheeks. She says. <laughs> You might not meet the right person. You might find out you can't have kids. You might be running in an ultra marathon and get caught in a fire. Even that age old adage, if you work hard, you'll succeed, is in its essence an exaggeration. It should really be changed to, if you work hard, you'll most probably succeed. But she will tell you one thing. If you don't practice GSA, you won't get any happier. So that's gratitude, savoring and anticipation. All right. Let's go into what that means. Well, gratitude. I think we know what gratitude means, don't we? But it's being thankful for all the little things. Sometimes, and I thought this was very interesting because I highlighted this bit. So I was happy, but often I still felt as though my life wasn't good enough. Interesting statement, hey? Mm. Even when you know there's things you can be happy for, there can be a nagging doubt that it should be happier than this there's something else anyone ever had i'm seeing a few knowing smiles here yeah relate to that anyone want to comment on that <laughs> you don't have to but you're welcome to i just saw someone post something the other day um on you know, one of the lovely social media platforms about what they were doing. And I think we've discussed, I think you and I have probably discussed this before, I've never been on this on this chat, but about does it get any better than that? Yeah. And does it mean that you're happy exactly in that moment? Or as some people call it, have you just settled for that's the best that you're gonna get? What's the mindset around that? Are you, yeah, is, is that good enough for you right there and then? Or is it, yeah, is it something else? Make sure, make sure you think about that. 
I do know the person and I have asked her. <laughs> That's a great And I haven't had an answer point. yet. It's a great point you've raised there because it like she says, it is a continuum, it's a journey. There's mm. no this is it, now I'm happy. You know, and, and sometimes you'll hear people say, When I get this promotion, then I can be happy, or when I get this business started, then I can be happy. When I get to go on holiday to wherever it is, then I can be happy. And you can be happy right in this moment, right now. Does that mean you're content that that's all you need? That's that's the end, that you know, you've achieved mm. this Zen state of happiness? No, it's an ongoing daily, it's a moment by moment decision really, isn't it? Yeah, well, you know, the, the news that I got the other day, I was, it sort of took a little while to sink in and I was up over the moon with what uh, the doctor had to say. And yeah, I got down as the officer. Yeah, yeah, it's all good. And then it's just like, well, there's no one else <laughs> joining me in this being happy. <laughs> What's going on? Um, but it was a bit of a double-edged sword because, um, yeah, she said, look, every, everything's great. You might have these events from time to time, but um, everything's good. I was like, oh, that's you know, a bit of a shame because, you know, I sold my race car. Do you know, you know, you didn't have to do that. I went, oh, really? Okay. So I didn't have to really do that. <laughs> So that was a real was deflator, wasn't it? Hey, was that a deflator then, knowing that you sold your car and you didn't need to? Yeah, but you obviously you know that I've replaced it with something else. And you know that's that, that's okay. Then I said, yeah, but it's a different sort of lifestyle sort of thing now than what it was beforehand. But now I've got this burning thing in the back of my head going, do I want to get another one? <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> well, I'm sure the, the powers to be will have something to say about that. Yeah. Good one. Yeah, that's a great example of, it, isn't it? You're happy in that moment, and then other things can can come in, or just the fact you, you didn't have anyone immediately there on the same level of happiness as you, kind of pulls it down a little bit. Coralie, did you want to add something to that? Um, could you be happy all the time? Would you want to? No. The variety, class of life, isn't it? Well. If, if you were, it's like anything, we get used to it. If, if you were, if that's your level of happiness, then would anything less than that suddenly make you unhappy? It's a really interesting concept, isn't it? Because it's about what, what's your definition of happiness to start with? It's, it's, a, it's just a word, isn't it? So it's a state or a feeling, but our feelings can change by the moment. And just as you have something really happy happen to you, you can then get hit with something unhappy in the same moment. But do you let it affect you? Do you choose to be dragged down or triggered by other people's issues or other people's you know external stuff that's going to happen around you? It's an interest. That's why she calls and it, it kind of aspiration. And it can happen so quickly. So I was driving home last night in my new old car on the freeway. Just, yeah, great windows down, having a nice cruise up the freeway until some clown decides to just come in from nowhere and try to take the front off my car. Yeah, <laughs> and, and you know, they did, but it can, yeah. how quickly it can change in a moment, can't it? Yeah, yeah. But it's the, the body, you know, it's the, the benchmark of happiness and the baseline of where you are. You, If you're happy like that all the time, then um, how do you realise when you're happier? You know what I mean? You know, where where is the, you've got to have, as Cody said, you've got to have, I think, the ups and downs to then realise when you're happy or happier and having having a, having a good day. You know, it'd be nice to have constant good days, but it is a bit like Groundhog Day then, I don't know. Where do you, where do you then go? And Would it become boring? Yeah. Well, maybe <laughs> the idea is just to raise your baseline. So you've mm. got, you know, your base of what you think is happy, but that could be higher. Yeah. So would you say then it's it's a baseline of being generally optimistic? Yeah, I suppose. Generally happy, but we we all know that that can change in a split second. So we can either, we can either let other people's things affect us, like when that guy tried to cut you off in the traffic, you could have let it ruin your mood, ruin your day. Or you could go, oh, well, he's obviously in a rush to get somewhere. Or he didn't see me or, you know, you can mm. just dismiss it. It's just, be, oh, that's one of those things, but I'm not going to let it ruin my day. I'm going to get on with being happy again. Didn't see my bright green car. Yeah. <laughs> um. <laughs> maybe he was colorblind. <laughs> maybe, maybe. 
<laughs> it is quite it is quite small and quite low so maybe you can see me as four-wheel drive um but I, I think you're right Kylie just raise raising the baseline and then sort of generally being more happy a higher percentage of the time mm. and yeah. not letting other stuff affect you yeah that's, that's good it. that's good <laughs> all right so um you said she'd done enough traveling and volunteering in developing countries to know how much I should be grateful for, but I was stuck in that trap of focusing on things that weren't going right for me. And because I'm one of those high achiever types, I thought it was a good thing to focus on the areas of my life that seemed to need improvement. Doing that, however, meant I wasn't operating from a state of contentment. This brings me to the biggest myth about showing gratitude that it might lead us to become complacent. Because if you're content with your life, doesn't that mean there's no room for improvement? No. Gratitude inspires compassion. It makes you want to give, which forces you to grow. Gratitude is part of growth. Interesting, huh? All right. She reminds herself that life is a gift, not a given that we're not here forever and that our lives are made up of myriad float fleeting moments that we can't catch and stall, but which we can be grateful for, appreciate and savor. Showing gratitude has got to be the easiest and quickest way to diminish negative feelings. It's an antidote to envy, bitterness, anger, hostility, boredom, fear, shame, humiliation, the list goes on. Interesting concept, oh, sorry. Very cool. interesting concept of just savoring i have conversations with a professional that i see occasionally and he just he, we talk about time and this moment is now and what i've just said is gone and how do you hang on to so everything it's just like it's a blink it's gone so you just start trying to get your head around that concept of trying to be happy all the time if you look too far forward um your the expectation is high but if you, why is it so easy for us to hang on to the, to the not so happy stuff that happened prior? That, that's gone. It's history. So it always gets my head when I start talking about this, about these ticks in time. You say, look at that clock. It's not going to be there again. It's gone again. And yeah. it just completely does my head in. Time is, it's a very interesting one. I've been watching some space documentaries recently. And, you know, they said mm. time is a human construct. Does time even actually exist? Is, is the past really gone? Is, is the future does the future maybe exist you know we're on this sort of continuum <laughs> our heads no, explode on me <laughs> <laughs> well so she says just because something is the antidote to negative emotion doesn't that mean it actually makes you happier right wrong there have been far too many studies on gratitude and its benefits for me to list them all here. Though if you're interested, you could read Janice Kaplan's The Gratitude Diaries and Thanks by Robert Emmons. She gives you a lot of re book references in this book. What we can take from them is that grateful people have stronger social connections and relationships, are less stressed, sleep better, have higher self-esteem, are more trusting and altruistic, and in general, more satisfied with life. Mm -hmm. practicing gratitude stops that stream of constant comparison with the joneses and other billion people whose lives you watch on instagram or whatever social media gratitude allows us to celebrate the present it magnifies positive emotions it helps us to be more resilient particularly in the face of adversity it's even been shown to reduce the frequency and duration of episodes of depression okay so you get it it's good shit <laughs> I mean, she say that? How was he? That's what she writes. Yeah, it's so, and she gives you examples. It's it's finding gratitude in the most tiny details around your life. Someone knits you a new sweater, or thank saying thank you to the waiter, and you mean it. In the moment when your one of your kids stops terrorizing you, your house, and your family pet long enough to lean against you, look up and say, "I love you," and you wonder how you got so lucky that's gratitude so there's lots of things gratitude is typically defined as a state that requires us to endorse two facts that a positive outcome has been achieved and that this positive outcome came from an external source and this is a question i highlighted because it reminded me of 
something my sister once said to me. So what the hell do I have to be grateful for? <laughs> well, if you go looking, there's quite a long list, isn't there? A huge list. Oh. Spider coming down. <laughs> Money spider. Money spider. Yes, thanks, Glenn. So that's interesting. What what you one of you said there about um, being satisfied. So here's here's the reservation. So this is the way her psych rebutted every single one of her reservations. I don't mean the where the Indians live. I mean what her <laughs> reservation about happiness. <laughs> If I'm grateful with my life as it is now, that means I'm satisfied with my lot. And therefore I'll have zero motivation to make any changes. I'll be a lazy lethargic lizard who never sees the world beyond her own street. That was her reservation. The rebuttal was from her site. No, you won't be a lazy lethargic lizard. Re research has shown that gratitude can be really motivating, especially because it makes you want to give back some of the goodness you've received. <laughs> Another reservation. Hmm, gratitude is just a bit naive and cliched, isn't it? I'm not really into all that woo-woo crystals and yoga stuff. <laughs> and the answer was, you don't have to wear flowing robes and crystals around your neck to practice gratitude. Anyone can do it anywhere, anytime, and with as much or as little spiritual attachment as they like. I think these are worth reading. I think it's quite funny. The next one, I know everything is not about me, but it kind of is, isn't it? I'm the one who's doing the work. I'm the one with the injury. This is as she's going through her recovery. Even if your life is about you right now, it doesn't have to be. Gratitude will give you a different perspective. Next reservation, or the last one here. It's hard for me to be grateful right now with everything I've been through and everything I'm dealing with. I mean, what could I possibly be grateful for? You can imagine someone saying that when you've just had 65% of your body burnt and, you, and you're going through surgeries and pain and everything else. This one is real. And there's power in being real with yourself, owning your emotions and accepting that you feel shit, angry, frustrated, annoyed, and so on. But gratitude will give you the perspective you'll need to find a way out of this. The more you do it, the more you'll see how much goodness surrounds you right now. So it's over to you, she says. You're at least a fully independent guinea pig. <laughs> so you can practice gratitude in a way that suits you. And she gives you some strategies. And these are things that um, that you've heard in, in our previous books, you know, with being specific about things, what you're exactly grateful for, keeping a journal, listening to great music, you might have a gratitude playlist. Um, if you can write things down, that's good. She struggles to, to do that because, um, she lost her fingers with the fire, but being, doing great, grateful or gratitude exercises, things like writing a list of three things that made your day good at nighttime. What, what was good today? Writing a thank you letter to someone. So there's, there's lots of different things, good strategies, and she gives you some other reference books to go and look at to give you some tips and ideas. Savoring. So this thing of savoring is the act of stepping outside of an experience to review and appreciate it. Any experience, positive, positive or negative, can be amplified or diminished depending on how much you think about it. Isn't that true? A problem becomes a big problem if you're focused on it and you, you're, you're like stirring yourself up into a frenzy about how's this going to come out? What's going to happen? Or what if this happens? And you start coming up with all these scenarios, don't you, in your head? You're thinking about it. You're churning it over. You're getting more and more stressed in a bad mood. And you can, you can go <laughs> and change that, can't you? Just by looking at something else. Focusing on something else. Focusing on something you can be grateful for. She gives an example. Savoring experience might mean you eat your chocolate chip cookie mindfully, thinking about the contrast between the dark chocolate chips and the buttery crumbs of the cookie. Makes me want to go and eat one now. 
it might be the sensation of getting into a hot shower after hitting a gym class you didn't feel like doing. Or it might mean you're reflecting on a past experience like running through a mountain range in New Zealand and being proud of your achievement. It's one of the reasons I have um, a screensaver. I have a slideshow and I go through things that I've achieved on my bucket list playing on it. So if my computer goes onto uh, onto slideshow mode, you know, where, the, where you're not using it for a few seconds and it sort of clicks over to, to that, I've got all these happy memories coming up. <laughs> That's one way I, I help myself to do that. So she then says, one of the massive benefits of savoring is that it can thwart hedonic adaptation. Hedy adaptation, that old chestnut, hey? What exactly is hedgy? She calls it for short, hedgy, hedonistic adaptation. It's a fancy term to describe the rapid way we humans become accustomed to our surroundings. For example, when you first get a new car, how do you treat it? Everyone who travels with you must hose and dry their shoes before entering. I've washed their hair, undergone a health check to look for signs of possible motion sickness and must only wear white so specks of dust are clearly visible. Even then you don't take the plastic off the seats. <laughs> Not just the new car. <laughs> Fast forward six months. Are you still taking the same precautions with the car? <laughs> yeah, I see that dirty keep cup with three day old coffee in it. That car's That car is anyone's game now. So this is hed hedonic adaptation at play. You become used to something and you begin to take it for granted. Whether that's husbands, wives, cars, houses, views. Uh, that's an interesting one because Joe and I, we, we moved into our, our house. We've been here six years now. And we said, we are never gonna take this view for granted. And we will go and sit and watch the sunset and savor that view because we wanted to remind us, we made a vow that we would always, we would never take it for granted, would always remind ourselves of what a fantastic view we've got where we live and how lucky we are to have that, how grateful we are to have that. We're not lucky we made it happen, but we're grateful. A bit of luck helps here and there too. <laughs> yeah, a little bit of luck with that. Yeah. So it applies to everything in our lives, doesn't it? Well, here's an example. This blew me away when I read this. A couple of years ago, I had yet another nose operation. This operation resulted in me being able to breathe through my nose for the first time in seven years. Kind of a big fucking deal, she writes. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine that. Uh, God. What were those first few nostrils full of oxygenated air like? You know how on a hot day, you take a sip of ice cold fizzy drink through a jumbo party straw and it's invigorating, intoxicating, energizing and pacifying all at the same time. Yeah, it felt like that, but a billion times better. Each time I breathed in, I marveled at my nostrils. I can't believe how much air is getting in through these bad boys. It's like a wind tunnel there. Holy smokes, here comes another rush of oxygen. How do you reckon I felt less than a week later? Oh yeah, I can breathe through my nostrils now. It's pretty awesome. A month later? Yeah, I've been able to breathe through my nostrils for a while now. A year later, what nostril surgery? Mm. What happened to me? I adapted to my circumstances. I got used to my nostrils. I even began to take them for granted. But what helped me stop this very natural tendency to take shit for granted was to savor it, relish it, reflect on it, ruminate on it, stop and enjoy the experience. Now you see why I like this book so much. Mm, yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's a very um, easy to read book and, and it's comic um, or comedic and it's um it's very australian and it's very down to earth it's just there's no she doesn't pull any punches you know she she writes like she speaks and she describes things really well so how else do you put the brakes on hedgy you know hedonistic or hedonic adaptation something hedonistic hedonic adaptation one be grateful 
to acknowledge and accept. Yes, buying a BMW will make you happier initially, then you'll just get used to it. it happens. Buying a new iPhone will make you happier initially, then you'll get used to it. It happens. And if something is inevitable, in my experience, it's far better to acknowledge and accept it rather than resist and deny it. But you enjoy it for a while you can, don't you? You know, you, you stretch out that new car smell or whatever, you know, new guitar smell. And enjoy it as long as you can. Three, magical relationships. When you first met your partner and there was lightning sparks going off and, and all that. <laughs> remember those days for novelty keep keep doing new and exciting things and savor them so when you take part in a, in a positive experience like eating a choc chick chick cookie jumping into the ocean participating in a fun run making a garden gnome <laughs> etc um simply savor the experience you could share it with another person go to a cafe and eat the cookies together and notice out notice out loud how bloody delicious they are <laughs> in the middle of a cafe going mm, yes amazing <laughs> uh, you could have some fun with that one couldn't you keep a souvenir of the activity such as the participation medal you got at the end of the fun run take a photo of the finished garden gnome and try to stay in the present moment the entire time and if you're like most people and you struggle with being mindful, go to page 67. We'll come back to that. I like to take photos, but Michael hates it. That's Michael's her partner. But that's difficult because she's a massive fan of documenting her entire life. But she also knows that Michael loves looking at photos of the surf, fish he's caught, and our son. Not necessarily in that order. So I take the photos anyway, knowing that while he'll dislike waiting for me to take another picture of the morning surf, he'll enjoy it later on. That's cool, isn't it? All right. What's the difference between savoring an experience and simply recording it? Go back to the definition of savoring. You're not on autopilot, sculling your coffee and rushing to work. You're consciously appreciating the subtle earthy notes of your mushroom latte and noticing how beautiful the frangipanis are in summer. If you're struggling with it, Come and sit under our gazebo for half an hour and you'll you'll get it. Some people save it by writing in the diary every day. Others share positive moments in conversations with friends and loved ones, and some meditate on them quietly. Some get up early in the morning to drink a cup of tea as the sun rises and think about all the cool elements of their life. Find a way to savor the big stuff and the little stuff. Pay attention to the fab things you do. Enjoy the feeling of, of having done them. It'll make you happier. Savoring. We got that one. We're all good with savoring. So we've got gratitude and savoring. And the third one, and I think we're going to run out of time. So we're going to just do this chapter and finish there, I think, today. Anticipation. So this is the one that's going to mess with your head, Glenn, this um, the time zone thing. Uh, imagine standing by the water's edge on a baking day. Think of staring at a slice of cake when you're starving. Think of that feeling before a first date with someone really hot. You're anticipating a positive experience. We need stuff to look forward to. I highlighted that in Orange People. We need stuff to look forward to. If you're looking forward to something as opposed to dreading it, it must be something that we enjoy, that makes us feel good, or is both of these things anticipatory joy is a thing so does that mean you're not living in the present well you are you're still living you can still live in the present and you can still anticipate positively something that you know is coming up like you can look forward to a holiday that you've booked but still be present you can still be enjoying the moment where you are here right now but knowing that you've got holiday coming up as well you can have long term small anticipations medium anticipations and big anticipations so there's little things that you have coming up 
that might seem trivial, like, you know, you're about to go out for breakfast. Um, you know, it's a small thing really, um, but it's nice and you know, it's going to be yummy and that's good. Medium is going for a big ass run in a couple of weeks for her, taking a mate on a bushwalk, launching a new campaign in my business. For you, it might be the copywriting seminar you've signed up for in six weeks or going mountain biking or cooking for friends at the weekend. And big things are even bigger than that. Like going away with Michael for our 10 year anniversary. We only traveled 40 minutes from where we live, but it still felt like a holiday. So that anticipatory joy boosts our happiness, gives our days meaning and purpose. And yes, very often what we anticipate becomes the things that we can savor once they're over or as you're doing them. And that's all stuff to be grateful for having done it. So there's your little circle of life right there. GSA, gratitude, savoring and anticipation. To sum up, in order to squeeze the most life and joy and happiness from our experiences, we can anticipate them, savor them and express gratitude for them for years to come. Yeah. What do you make of that, people? I sort of put that into a, a timeline. Because it's time, I've got this time thing going on in my head now. Yeah. So gratitude, past, savoring, present, anticipation, the future. Yeah. Pretty much. Pretty much, yeah. Gratitude can also be um, present as well as past. Yeah, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Well, in fact, gratitude can be for future too, because you can be grateful for the opportunity that you know you've got mm. coming up. Or, but so that one tra sort of traverses all three. Um, and you can you can still savor things that have happened in the past by reminding yourself of them. So yeah, you, there. But I get your point. There's definitely an emphasis towards those three three mm. zones, isn't there? With those three things you can they can be spread across the whole spectrum but there's definitely something in this there's, and there's definitely uh she does an interview with um eddie jacku is the next part of this the, just before this chapter closes and he's a concentration camp survivor he lost 150 million sorry 150 family members in the holocaust he now lives in sydney and calls himself the happiest man on earth and she asked him, what is key to your happiness? And he said, being happy, be happy with what you have. This is the most important aspect to being happy. How has your understanding of happiness changed over the years? As you get older, you acquire more wisdom and become more flexible in your attitude. So she studied this, the effects of happiness on people. Um, he did as well. And yeah it's it really is gratitude savoring and anticipation you know that um eddie jacku i've just the name when you said the happiest man in the world he actually passed away at 101 in late 2021 yeah. and he only had his memoir published when he was 100. wow wow <laughs> yeah his memo was called The Happiest Man on Earth. It's published when he was 100 years old. Immediate bestseller, according to Wikipedia. But yeah. yeah, I think it would be a book that would would uh, horrify you at moments and would also inspire you greatly. And I haven't read it yet, so the, but that's just what I would, just from this this few the few sentences she puts in here about him. Yeah, yeah. Ooh. So we'll we'll go into the, into um, probably chapters two and three i would think next next time um but those that's really a great start to the book and certainly i think for me that when i read that example of breathing through your nose we just take that so much for granted don't we and then there's a person who's effectively lost most of her nose because it was burnt off so that really gives you a sort of um and then even then 
within a within a year of losing it or having it restored she's lost the impact of how great she felt with that first breath through her nose so it really is a very um, inspirational book it's a book that makes you think a lot and i'd say definitely it's one of the best books that i've read in a long time uh, and it's very relatable it's very it's written in a very easy going aussie mm -hmm. style might not be to everyone's cup of tea um, for those people who don't get the Aussie humour and the and the sort of down to earthness of it, but I love it. And um, yeah, I hope that it has an impact on you in the same way that it has on me. What what are your thoughts about this this morning, guys? Any any last thoughts before we close? Great book, very informative. Um, but um, yeah, it'd be interesting to have a look at her other books <laughs> as well. Yeah. But she, like a lot of the interviews said, she did write this book differently. It's more like she's speaking than, than, than kind of the stories that were in the other books. <laughs> so as, as with everyone, uh, things evolve. Her writing style would have evolved, I would say, to be more relatable. I, I haven't read the other books yet, but I, I, I'm the same as you, Stan. When I find a good, a good book or a good author, uh, I want to see what else they've written, and that's why... Um, some of the other ones that we've we've covered, you know, Brene Brown, for instance, um, I'm reading uh, books by a guy called Ryan Holiday at the moment and really enjoying and enjoying his stuff. Um, yeah, any other thoughts, guys? I think it's yeah. The, it sounds like the way the way that it's written could be quite an easy read, and um, it's a very easy read. Keep, yeah. keep keep an eye out for it. I think and and starting off with this book. At the beginning of a year, you know, set set the tone for the rest of the year. I've, I've made a, a few conscious changes and efforts to get myself up and motivated a bit earlier in the morning and a bit more exercise and that sort of stuff. And um, and it's it's not. I didn't get out on the first of January and go right. I'm going to do this. That certainly wasn't the fact. It was more like you know, get through the holiday period and all the, the binging on Christmas food, as you said, you know, Christmas cake and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And then we just make a bit more of an effort to it. And I think being, you know, by driven by a couple of doctor's visits, making, you know, making sure that things are getting back on track and that sort of stuff. Um, it's a good book, I think, to start off the year, set the tone for the year. So yeah, like, that was my thought, exactly. It, it yeah. really is um, an uplifting book mm. and, uh, and, and it'll definitely make you think, for sure. Coralie, anything? If you swap the words around a bit and say gratitude, then anticipation, then savour, it spells gas. Might help you remember. <laughs> Who wants to start the year with gas? <laughs> Use the American terminology of gas as in fuel rather than waste. Yeah. I think that's something we'll probably think. Yeah, yeah but we're Australian. Gas. 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 <laughs> now we're all laughing and now we're all happy because it's fart jokes <laughs> well my wife just waved a bottle of baileys in at me which indicates that i've got a coffee with baileys in it coming my way so uh, god you get spoiled up there get taken out spoiled, breakfast. my wedding anniversary or something baileys coffees breakfast <laughs> All right, guys. Well, it's been great having the pleasure of your company. I'm glad that uh, that you've enjoyed the start to this book, uh, Happy, and that it's made you a little happier, perhaps. And uh, let's have a great week ahead. And I'll catch you all again very shortly. Yep. See you all, guys. Hey. Have a good one. Cheers, guys. <laughs>